This sermon was not intended to be about Pentecost, but the more I prepared this morning, it kind of kept came back to that, and so I decided I do need to share those first four verses at least, Acts chapter 2, that's where you can hear about, read about, see about uh, what this great event was on that very day of Pentecost where those early apostles gathered together in that room, maybe somewhat afraid because of um, the, the attacks placed against them, the, the, uh, this upstart, this new thing they might have called it at that time that was going on. People didn't like it. The Jews didn't like it. The Gentiles didn't like it. The Romans didn't like it. No one liked it in a lot of cases, but God did, and God would honor it, and God would give the emphasis towards this movement, this, this uh, direction of faith that he had in mind for all of us, and we call it Christianity. We, we just call it uh, the love of God with us this morning as we celebrate Pentecost Day, and the, the words are the first four verses, which was the beginning of, of where we're at today. When they Day of Pentecost, and this is 50 days after the resurrection. It was 10 days ago for the ascension, and now 50 days after the resurrection. This was a day of a feast of, of celebration that the Jewish people celebrated anyway. It was a harvest festival that they actually celebrated 50 days after the Passover. So they were, people were there anyway, but then there was these, this handful of believers, which Peter was one of them, and the disciples and others gathered there. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in that one place. God had brought them together just like he assembled us here this morning. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Why wind? Why fire? I think just spectacular God's presence entering with them. Yeah, some of it was attention getting. Um, you know, you might go to a sporting event. What are they, you know, they're you know, you hear loud music, and you'll hear a lot of excitement. Well, there was a lot of excitement around this. Uh, just maybe a poor example, but something we do today. Uh, it came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Um... Wow. That had to be a sight, don't you think? <laughs> think about it. You think they weren't scared? Yeah, I'm sure that many of them were shaking in their boots uh, about all this that took place. The, the wind, the fire, uh, the, the tongues, everything that they were speaking. The, you know, they gave them the, 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 the speech or the, through their tongues to communicate, to share the gospel and share it, to be able to begin to share it and so that everyone would understand it. I'm sorry that we pastors sometimes don't share it that people understand, but it's meant to be understood. It's really not that hard to understand. It's, you know, Jesus came and by the hand of God and, and died for our sins and, and then came back to life to prove his eternal power and his eternal love and that he promises then through the Holy Spirit to be with us now and forevermore. So, it's, it's powerful. It's the, it's the real deal. And then this fire thing. I have a hard, maybe the hardest thing with that. It wasn't one that was going to burn them up, but it rested on them. A little bit symbolic maybe, but I believe there was a flame somehow surrounding them. And, and that speaks to God's purifying presence is what some people think. That his power over sin and death. That, you know, when something needs to be consumed or taken care of, we, we had a big old bonfire over here burning down a building the other, well, we had it collapsed, and it wasn't, we didn't do it illegally, we don't think, and it was down, and, and but that fire consumed all that old wood and everything, it's, it's gone, and God's consuming power can also, you know, work within us to consume the impurities, the sin that we have in our very life, and that's part of who God is, and he made his presence known to these people that were gathered there, and it was noisy. Now, from there, we won't go what Peter began to do after that, because he preached a sermon that, like it wouldn't end. You know, he was there well past lunch, preaching the sermon that followed there. So, I know y'all like to get to lunch, so we may even have to cut this one short this morning. And, uh, but it's, I just, I give thanks that I, I have the opportunity, and I hope you do too, to call upon the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's what we need. 
We need to do more often to be reminded of that. And don't leave the third person of the Trinity. Still one God, but don't leave out the third person of the Trinity. Because you can do your, your, your shortchanging yourself and God. Okay? Let's, uh, Billy Graham said it this way. Because I, as I kind of spoke before prayer, the Holy Spirit can convict us. And that's one of the, the great attributes of the Holy Spirit, to be able to convict us. You ever felt like that you needed to turn things around? You wanted to put some things behind you and stop doing them? Holy Spirit can be your greatest asset in doing just that. Call upon that higher power. Trust in that higher power, and that power is God and, and through that presence. So it's Holy Spirit's job to convict you. God's job then will be to judge us. But, you know, as for a Christian, we're judged as through the righteousness of Christ, because we've accepted him. But it's our job, and Billy Graham says, my job to love. And didn't he do that well? He loved for, what, 99 years. So praise God for giving an example like that. So we move on now to where I'm at with the I am statements, because I think they tie in so well with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I call we call them maybe the... The metaphors of the Messiah, they're found mostly in the book of John, where Jesus took the opportunity to begin to describe who he was by saying, I am this, and I am this, and using some everyday terminology to do just that, to, to tell the, the folks, the flock around him, who he really was. And he makes these statements in, in uh, John's gospel throughout this. We oftentimes, have you ever made a statement, I am what? what? If you made a statement about yourself, you might say, I am a son or a daughter. I am a wife or a husband. I am a friend. I am a mother or daughter, a father. I am brother, sister. You know, I, I am a Cardinals fan, John. Uh, we might describe ourselves some way with those I am statements. You know, I might say I'm roughly 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 I am 100 and X number of pounds, I am this or I am that. X number of pounds, you know, we don't want to go there too often. Sometimes we wish we were taller, don't we? Um, but as a child of God reminded us coming through Pentecost how the connection began to happen with those early church people, if you really want to say who you am, I am a child of God. I might be all those other things. I am a sinner as well, saved by the grace of God. But I am a child of God. Don't ever forget that. You want to feel younger than 98. You want to feel younger than 64. I, you know, I, I can call myself a child of God. And we're all children, his children together kind of brings us down to a, another level. One of Jesus' statements I preached on a few weeks ago was the, the vine and the branches. Where Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And as a branch, it's kind of like we're one of those children as one of the branches off that main vine. Which leads me to today's passage. So let's give thanks for this passage. Lord, we give thanks that for your light that came into the world, your light that illumines us, uh, guides us, and leads us, and through this special verse, gives us a more descriptive view of who you are. Lord, I pray with all my heart, mind, and soul that we can live in your reflection and reflect your light to others. Thank you for this verse we're about to share this morning. Amen. It is a pretty simple little verse, and we've probably heard it. And, and then, remember as a child when, when you used to hold up your little finger, maybe at Bible school, what did we sing? This what? Little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. Sometimes that light gets a little dim. Sometimes it can brighten the room, right? Aren't there just some people that walk into a room and it's like they have a wow factor? And they light up the room. We've said that about some people. They, they light up the room. But our little light, the big thing is that the light just needs to shine. But put it under a bushel. What is it? I'm going to let it shine. 
I, I should remember that my mother would be so disappointed in me right now. Uh, so then Jesus, I better move on. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. Darkness, bad things. We associate darkness sometimes with bad things, don't we? Scary things. Kids are afraid. They want night lights because they're afraid of the dark. Follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. I kind of think, associate this too with Jesus walking into your life. Jesus suddenly walking into your life. And you've ever seen somebody that just suddenly came alive, accepted Christ in their life? Maybe for some we haven't seen that lately. That's too bad. But suddenly they just beam. That light begins to shine in them. Problem is sometimes we're, we're too quick to throw water on it instead of throw timbers on it, keep it burning. He is the light of the world. It's one of those I am statements. I am who I am, Jesus once spoke to Moses. Moses saw that burning bush there and he started to approach that burning bush and Jesus said, or God said, the Father said, wait a minute, Moses. Wait a minute, Moses. Don't come too close. What are you standing on? Hallowed ground. God is powerful. Trust me. God is powerful. Don't come that close. Take, show some respect. Don't discount who I am. Know who I am. You're standing on hallowed ground. And then, kind of a few verses later, when God's kind of trying to change Moses' life to go do his work for him, to be his bidder before Pharaoh and to be his spokesman, Moses again tried to rush things a little bit and said, now, they're not going to believe me. Who, who do I say that you are? And God said, I'm simply, I am who I am. And that is this term to the Jewish people was, was such a powerful term, Yahweh, that the people wouldn't even speak it. Such a respected name of God, Yahweh. Sovereign God. Present God. Great love and respect for this term of I am or Yahweh. God's presence with them. I am. The great I am. Jesus then came completely reinforcing that presence of God. I am here. I am now. I am all these things to you. Remember that. And this, today, if we go back and look, and now he says, I am the light. And we, we look at light for a lot of things. I, last summer when we got the opportunity to go up in Maine, we, we did the lighthouse thing. Anybody done the lighthouse thing? In Maine? It's, it's cool. It's, isn't it nice? It's, it's you don't, you know, I never thought about looking at Lighthouse. In fact, that's someplace Teresa wanted to go. I, you know, I'll go to a beach or a ball game. And Teresa said, let's go. And I said, okay. And uh, so we went, and the lighthouses were really neat. And think about a lighthouse. That's just a, a, that little bit. I just thought I took a good picture here too, by the way, if you can't see it well enough. But the, the, the light is a, a small light in that tower of that lighthouse. But you know, to a, a seafaring vessel out in the water, that one beacon, what's it give them a sense of, of the presence of where land is and, and the warning of be careful and don't go in too close and all those things. It's, it's you know, it's, it's like it can be an extreme spotlight for those people out there on, on the ocean. And it's, it's, they see it and they know it. Jesus said, come and see and know. I'm here. It shines brightly. His light shines. There's another picture too. I, I love this one because of the water in the background. But, um, and the light dispels darkness. Just going to go just one of these this morning, I think. Um, 
of course, darkness. Let's just take that little analogy of light and dark this morning. Light enables us to see things, doesn't it? Where darkness might have consumed. Light suddenly comes in. Of um, Now the time has changed, but when I come here early during the winter time, I come in here early and, and prepare on Sunday morning, I have to have a little light up here to, to shine so I can... To, prepare the way I want to prepare, but now I, I've got the light from the outside, but I need that to overcome the darkness so I can begin to navigate and, and know my way around. Without light, we can't see anything. C.S. Lewis said this way, he says, I believe in Christ like I believe in the sun. Not only because I see it, but because by it all things are seen. By Christ, by his light, all things are seen. Seen. It leads me to Ephesians 5.13 and 14, which tell us this, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. If I shine this, uh, if I'm in a dark room, I got my little flashlight up here. What'd you say they call these down in Haiti? Cor Corey said one, they call these flashers, I believe, down in Haiti. That's what you said, didn't they? Flash, they call it flash. Because they don't have power like we have the ability to go turn the light switch on. You know, when the sun goes down at night, there's no power to illuminate. So they, have, they bring out their flash. And this, this will expose things. But everything exposed by the light suddenly becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. All right, to take that verse quickly and kind of break it down. You know, if, if you put your light, life in the light of Christ, things kind of come out in the open. You might see a few warts. I might see a few scars. I might see a, a few things I don't even want to look at. I don't want to deal with. But, you know, I, I have my issues. I have the sin that I need to deal with or have dealt with with left scars or still nagging at me need to be exposed to the light. And once it is, everything that is illuminated then can begin to bear light. All you know, as a Christian then, I begin to bear light once I begin to deal with my own sin. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper. Yeah, there might be a person or two here this morning sleeping. Um, that might be a reminder. But, <laughs> wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I think we need to end it there this morning. Let's, let's take our Let's put it in gear, okay, as a church. Let's uh, turn the lights on, and let's go forward. A lot of exciting things can still be done in the kingdom of God. We haven't been shut out. We haven't been put out to pasture as the body of Christ. We still have a light to shine. Bible school. We're going to shine that light that week to 100 kids or so. But that's kids. And some of your teaching or helping, thank you. We need that because you're letting your light shine. But you're in a workplace, you're, a, you're in the, the mission field every day of your life. Let your light shine. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks that you are the, the light, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I pray your light shines upon each person gathered here so that in turn our light might cause other lights to shine. Empower us through your Holy Spirit and lead us into your path that is everlasting, I pray. Amen.